All right, ultrasonic and radar level measurement, ILM 310-302E. Uh, good ILM here, not a lot of math, uh, just a teeny weeny little bit of math and uh, looking at the devices specifically and their characteristics. Uh, the reason ultrasonic and radar are, are together is because they are very similar in terms of uh, mounting and, and science. Um, distinctions, you know, made basically in, in how, how they generate their signals. Uh, and we'll look at um, lots of different mounting uh, precaution, installation precautions, calibration, again, very straightforward for both of them and pretty much the same. Uh, again, the major consideration with most of this ILM is, is mounting uh, and things that we have to consider when we're installing them. So let's see what that looks like. Here we're going to look at uh, continuous and point level measurement. So different uh, applications here for uh, these devices. Objectives are describing the principles and applications of ultrasonic level instruments as well as radar instruments and describing the installation requirements for ultrasonic level instruments and also radar instruments. So ultrasonic, ultrasonic what? Uh, ultrasonic level measurement operates using high frequency sound waves, uh, ultrasonic, sonic means sound, um, and it's ultrasonic. ultrasonic because they are in a very high frequency range, uh, 20,000 hertz to 70,000 hertz. And the basic science behind uh, ultrasound is not that different uh, than the science behind uh, radar. Um, basically what happens, we project a, a sound wave for ultrasound. Uh, it shoots out of the uh, transmitter, hits the process fluid, is reflected back off the process fluid to the receiver, which is usually built in the same uh, device. Uh, we know how fast tra uh, sound travels, so by taking the time and the speed that sound travels, we can calculate uh, the distance that the sound wave has traveled. Um, major distinction between ultrasonic and radar is radar use, uh, uses microwaves or radio waves, uh, which are a little bit different in terms of the speed uh, that they travel, but otherwise they're, they're very similar in terms of uh, science. So continuous measurement, probably don't need to mention it, but tracks and reports on the PV as it changes and is an active, uh, always changing measurement, whereas point detection is basically uh, a switch type indicator. Uh, and when we talk about some of these devices, you'll notice that the signal may be a continuous uh, signal or it may be pulsed. Uh, in applications where there is a pulse signal available, the pulse signal is generally uh, more powerful and more sensitive. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a quick uh, video here, hopefully, which works. Perfect, so far so good. Uh, don't see the video there, Tyler. Okay. Trying to figure this out here. You know what? Oh, uh, shoot. I just see the PowerPoint screen. I don't see the. Video. Yeah. I got things all mucked up here. This is not what's supposed to be happening. All right, here we go again. You know what? I'm going to leave the video uh, out for now uh, just because it takes time that I might not have. Uh, and for some reason, I got my technology all scrambled up here. Uh, so we'll we'll kind of we'll we'll let you guys look at that video itself. Uh, it, it's a good little video. I do recommend watching it. Are we back on the PowerPoint here? Yep, we're back on continuous and point. All right. All right. So a uh, good video, the guy goes in and he describes uh, ultrasonic and then he compares it to radar. So it's a very good little video. It really kind of encapsulates the whole IOM. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of leave that for you guys to watch uh, afterwards. Okay, so looking at continuous ultrasonic level measurement here, standard application where we have a vessel and a transmitter mounted on top. 
Uh, the science behind ultrasonic and also radar is called time of flight measurement, uh, again, which is basically saying how long does the signal spend uh, traveling. Um, and so there's a few variables that we have to consider if we look at the diagram of the, of the tank here and, and the science behind it. So the first one, of course, is the velocity of sound, uh, which will be given to you any, any questions that you have. But it does vary a little bit uh, depending on the density of air because that's usually what the signal is traveling uh, through. But generally, it's around the 320, 340 meters per second uh, range. Time, uh, of course, is going to be in, in milliseconds that it takes for a pulse to be sent out and returned. Uh, H is going to be the process height in meters. Uh, X is going to be the distance the transmitter is away from the bottom. So when you configure ultrasonics, uh, there's a lot of different variables that you have to punch in, a lot of physical measurements that you have to take. Um, but the math itself is, is relatively simple. Uh, D for distance to time travels, and it's not all in this diagram, but the next slide uh, will show you uh, how we use these variables. Okay, here's an example from the ILM um, showing some of the variables again, uh, velocity of sound, 320 meters per second. Uh, in this example, the time uh, that the signal uh, took to travel was 12.5 uh, milliseconds, and the empty distance, distance E here, uh, was 5 meters. So if we do uh, some uh, relatively simple calculations, distance equals velocity times time, uh, in this case, is uh, will give us four meters. So this tells us that in this amount of time, at this speed, that signal traveled uh, four meters. The important thing to remember is that half of this distance is to the level, and the other half of that distance is the way back. So you'll see that the formula uh, is going to be d divided by 2, uh, again, because it is going there and back. So then we can derive uh, the actual level L by taking uh, our E distance and subtracting uh, the distance divided by 2. So in this case, our distance E is given as 5 meters. We subtract our 4 meters that our signal traveled divided by 2 because it's going there and back. And that tells us that the level in our tank is going to be uh, three meters. So it's uh, pretty straightforward mathematically uh, to figure out uh, the level based on the, the speed of sound and the amount of time that it takes for the signal to travel there to the surface and to return back. Applications. Uh, we, ap ultrasonic transmitters are non-contact devices, which makes them excellent devices for uh, applications which involve uh, corrosive coating, scaling, uh, viscous fluids, dirty fluids, and larger particles, uh, solids. Uh, as a result of uh, their suitability for all these different applications, they are uh, very uh, common. They do, of course, have issues, and as we go through the ILMs here, um, probably the biggest thing to focus on is the strength and weaknesses of the different uh, technologies and variations of the devices as we look at them. Applications that give trouble uh, to ultrasonics uh, includes flu fluid uh, that have heavy foam layers or heavy vapor layers and solids that have uh, particles that are small or dusty or fluffy. And the best way to think about it is uh, you're dealing with sound here, so anything that can muffle sound generally is going to be a problem for an ultrasonic transmitter. Turbulence, foam, and dust, uh, kind of the big three uh, issues that are uh, related to ultrasonic. Uh, they will de uh, degrade the effectiveness of the signal. Uh, because that signal is affected by the density of the medium that it travels uh, through. So in a perfect situation, uh, it's just air between the, the transmitter and the surface level, uh, but often you'll get uh, different things in there, dust, foam, uh, turbulence, and, and we'll talk about different uh, considerations that we have to use uh, in order to mitigate uh, some of those problems and still be able to use these devices. And the first one we talk about is uh, a stilling well. Uh, which we see here, which is basically just a pipe put down in the process uh, that separates any turbulence or foam or dust uh, that may be present in the tank and isolate, isol isolates it using uh, essentially what is a large diameter piece of pipe uh, that uh, is used to just provide a nice uh, calm area for the device to measure. 
We can use these devices uh, as continuous level measurements as we saw in the previous examples where we can do some math or we can use them as point uh, measurement uh, devices. Uh, a couple of different variations of point measurement devices in terms of ultrasonic. The first one is called a damp vibration technology device. Here basically it's like a drum skin uh, that vibrates at a certain frequency uh, and when it's in open air it will vibrate at its design frequency and when it gets submerged or covered by a, a different material, a more dense material, it will uh, damp that vibration or slow that frequency of vibration down and that is an indicator that level has been uh, achieved. The second style or technology is called absorption, uh, which basically works the same way as a standard ultrasonic uh, transmitter does, but it uses sound propagation. Um, and basically when that sound is transmitted uh, through air, um, it has one particular type of frequency that it travels at when it's transmitted again through a, a, a medium like water. Um, that, that sound wave is amplified and that's kind of an example. If you ever go to a swimming pool and you're banging the bottom of a, of a swimming pool, you'll see that the, uh, that the sound uh, travels quite readily. Uh, through uh, liquid. So in this case, the signal uh, gets enhanced. Point level detectors, of course, uh, generally used for high alarm trips over fill signals or some type of uh, alarms. Um, there are no moving parts for ultrasonics and very low maintenance requirements. So all you really have to worry about is uh, coding for the most part. Installation and mounting styles, there's lots of different ones, uh, whether they're threaded or flanged, uh, different applications, different vessels. Uh, the main consideration, and it, and it really applies to ultrasonic and radar as we go through it here, is we want to make sure that we have a nice clear path for the beam to travel on. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about vessel obstructions and things like that, as well as uh, different mediums uh, that that cause problems. Um, but as a general rule, the housing uh, or the transmitter will have both the transmitter and the receiver in it. Although, as we see in this diagram uh, here on the bottom, um, they could be uh, separate and they could be mounted uh, inside the tank or outside the tank. Uh, lots of different potential applications and instant methods are possible with these devices. Some of the problems uh, that we identify in the ILM, there's five of them. Uh, four on this slide. Uh, so geometry, uh, again, we want to make sure that that signal gets reflected back to the transmitter. So we have to consider geometry, obstructions, things like manways and pipes uh, intruding into the vessel. Uh, a specific thing that we uh, talk about called ringing, um, full and turbulence, which we've addressed before, and also uh, temperature effects because temperature uh, has great effects on density uh, of of fluids and gases. So changing temperatures changes density, uh, which in turn can create problems for uh, ultrasonic transmitters. So we'll hit on these ones uh, individually really quickly here. Uh, geometry, again, uh, vessels with irregularly shaped bottoms require special attention. Again, we want that signal to come down and bounce back up to be received again. So um, we wanna make sure that we um, install it properly here. So a particular application in the ILM here is a vessel with a dome tank. And you'll see the differences here between uh, mounting it on the side where we say that uh, the ideal placement is about half of the radius of the vessel. So in this area, rather than putting it here in the center, uh, because this essentially acts like a satellite dish or a parabola, and uh, we can get a multitude of different angular uh, reflections uh, from this type of geometry. So it's important to consider geometry. Obstructions, oops, that was supposed to happen here. Obstructions, uh, vessels with obstructions require attention, uh, of course, due to uh, false readings that will be uh, received when uh, signals are reflected off these obstructions inside the vessel. So things like ladders and piping, things like that. Okay, ringing, this is a very specific uh, one to ultrasonic here. Uh, and it has to do with the amount of time that it takes for a signal to be transmitted and received and the capabilities of the processor to calculate uh, that time. Um, there is a minimum distance and it's usually around 30 centimeters uh, from the face of the sensor to the maximum uh, 
fill height that it can possibly measure. And if you get inside this zone here, and it's often called a banking, a blanking zone, uh, the electronics just can't measure the signal fast enough. And the term for that is called ringing. So uh, we have to have a, a minimal distance uh, between the transmitter and the upper range value uh, of the process or we won't be able to sense it. Okay, dead time may have to be introduced to eliminate the problem. So a couple things that you can do, you can either lower your upper range value or you can add a nozzle on here and, and raise uh, the transmitter to uh, alleviate that condition. Turbulence, foam and dust, a um, couple things that you can do, uh, bottom mount or stilling well, and we've seen the stilling well before, and we saw a diagram earlier of mounting it on the bottom, uh, which takes uh, the foam uh, dust and vapor out of play entirely. Temperature, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, as it changes, so does the fluid or vapor density. This has an effect on the speed of the sound and can cause inaccurate readings. Um, to get around this, most transmitters are, uh, are built with temperature compensation built into them already. So it's not typically something that we uh, as technicians have to deal with. Aiming. Uh, can be very critical, again, not just in terms of reflections, but in terms of getting a representative measurement. Uh, because ultrasonics can be used on liquids uh, and solids as well, so liquid application is pretty straightforward. Uh, we want the reflection, again, to come off a flat surface so that it can be uh, received. We don't have that application. Uh, for example, we have this, uh, this slope here. Um, which is called the angle of repose, and it's just a natural characteristic of what happens to a solid as it piles up. We want to try to be perpendicular to that, uh, to that angle. So uh, plus or minus five degrees is a specification uh, that they uh, mentioned in the ILM, but the idea is you want the signal to be perpendicular to the surface uh, that we're measuring. Special application for uh, ultras ultrasonic here is uh, underground uh, cavities here. And you'll see that it's a very specific application and it's measuring the interface uh, or the, the interface between the brine and the hydrocarbons uh, inside of a, a cavity well. Okay, special features. Um, beyond just providing uh, level measurement here, the electronics inside the transmitter uh, can be uh, configured with different algorithms that allow us to do uh, things like volume calculations as well as something called false echo detection, which gets mentioned in a slide a little bit later on. Um, but it's a way of uh, using a filter basically to screen out any false uh, signals that you may get. And when the ultrasonic uh, level device creates uh, a signal uh, through the software, uh, it'll look something, uh, something like this, where every peak represents uh, some type of a reflection. And again, ideally, we want to make sure that we get the reflection that is representative of the process that we're trying to measure, not so much uh, of those disturbing objects here. So there is software um, that we can use that uh, we can configure to tell it to ignore certain signals, which we believe to be erroneous. Calibration, pretty straightforward. Uh, this applies not only to um, these ultrasonics, but as well as, as radars here. Um, with all the proper information, the transmitter can be factory calibrated um, off the data sheet, for example. Um, but when was the last time that the data sheet and the field actually matched up properly? So that's something to be aware of, even though your data sheet says the vessel is this big and the nozzles are here and there, you want to make sure that you verify that. So the best practice uh, is to perform the calibration on site where all those variables are present. Uh, and if, if possible, of course, doing the, what I call the wet calibration, uh, which means draining it down to your lower range uh, value and setting the four milliamps and then filling the vessel up to its upper range value and setting uh, the 20 milliamp value. And I call that a wet calibration. Uh, you can also do single point calibrations where you uh, measure the actual level in the vessel uh, and then adjust the transmitter to reflect that level. So calibration wise, relatively simple. Okay, point level uh, installation here, moving away from the continuous level measurement into point measurement here. Uh, just like any type of a, a point device, uh, it essentially is a switch and where you mount it uh, is going to be the level that you're expecting to 
uh, to trip at here. So damped, uh, just like any other type of switch here. Uh, absorption style, the only difference between the absorption style really and the damp style here is that uh, this particular application down here, E, uh, by chiseling at a little bit of an angle, does give you a little bit more of a dead band uh, in that switching uh, situation, uh, but for the most part, the, the installation characteristics are, are the same here. Uh, they don't activate until they become submerged uh, entirely, and the difference in frequency is sensed by the electronics. So that was a pretty quick little thing of ultrasonic, and uh, that's good. Um, radar, again, very similar. The major distinction here uh, between radar and ultrasonic is that radar, which is sometimes uh, called a microwave, uses high frequency radio waves instead of sound. That's, that's the big difference. Uh, how it works is still called time of flight, meaning that the signal travels down to the surface and back. Uh, we divide that time by two in some simple math formula, and that tells us the distance that that signal uh, had to travel. Frequency uh, for radar compared to ultrasonic is in the gigahertz uh, versus uh, what we had before, which had, uh, what, was a megahertz before, I don't remember, but um, much higher frequency waves. Okay, we're going to discuss uh, invasive and non-invasive types of radar. So the non-invasive types uh, are similar uh, to ultrasonic in that they use uh, uh, a transmitter that's kind of a cone, and the, the invasive types are contacting. So we'll, we'll look at those individually as well. Okay, first invasive. Wait a second. First non-invasive. Okay, non-invasive. Uh, Radar transmitters look very similar to ultrasonics. We have a transmitter body with a, uh, with a generator and a receiver built into it. Uh, the major distinction here is we have a wide variety of different types of cones. Uh, as we go through the ILM here, you'll see that there's a lot of specific characteristics associated with the size of the cone, uh, the frequency, and their particular application. So when they're measuring uh, the cones and the beams coming out of radars, um, the specifications are built on where they lose half of their effectiveness here. So 50% of their effectiveness is kind of how they uh, gauge uh, the radar um, the radar frequency ranges. So low frequencies, 6 gigahertz, high frequencies, 26 gigahertz. So we'll see applications for the 6 to 10 range and we'll see different applications for the higher range. And those are the types of things that you'll be needing to uh, look out for specifically in this next section. Okay, so the differences between these frequencies, we'll look at low frequency, those six to 10 gigahertz devices. Uh, they have longer wavelengths, uh, which is, uh, ignores instructions better. They're better in dust, steam, agitated fluids, uh, fluids and foams. The disadvantages here is they have lower resolution and larger horn, science, uh, horn sizes, and you can see that in this example here. High frequency, smaller horn, more focused beam. So the advantages of these uh, high frequency devices here, uh, smaller horn for a given beam angle, which brings us better resolution, uh, smaller port sizes, physically port sizes in the vessel, uh, and better energy focus for solid applications. Disadvantages here, they're not as forgiving to dust, uh, foam, and buildup. Um, so you see here they have different applications, and these are great test questions, of course. Uh, most of the questions in here are going to be application-based. Two different types of non-contact uh, radar transmitters that we're going to look at. Uh, first one is called frequency-modulated continuous wave, uh, and the second one is a pulse radar and they said earlier that if you see an application that mentioned pulsed, uh, pulsed is generally a, a stronger uh, signal uh, and made for a specific application. So we'll look at them uh, as comparative technologies. Okay, frequency modulated continuous wave. The sensor oscillator basically sends down a linear frequency sweep and that's a fancy dancy term here. Uh, it goes down to the surface of the uh, medium, just as it does in the ultrasonic, and then it returns. Um, we measure the time difference, really, 
uh, between the two signals. So this is a signal that gets sent out and the returning signal uh, follows by behind it by some kind of a, a phase lag here. Um, and the relationship between these two signals is proportional to the distance to the surface. Okay, pulsed radar. Just like ultrasonic sensor, pulsed radar uses the time of flight. All these technologies do. Uh, the pulsed wave travels at the speed of light, so it's really uh, very fast. And I don't think we mentioned much more, uh, much more than that. Okay, this next section is the bulk of the ILM here, talking about invasive or contacting type uh, radar devices, which we also call guided wave radar. Guided wave radar, as the name would imply, uses uh, a guide, uh, typically a rod or a cable, which guides the microwaves from the sensor down to the material being uh, measured. Uh, you'll see here in this diagram, oh, they, these circles here should be around the probe, but the way that this one works is it sends out uh, signals, and this is uh, identified in the video that I skipped earlier, but the way it works, rather than sending a pulse of sound, uh, which is really uh, a pulse of sound, like a ticking sound uh, from the ultrasonic that travels down here and bounces back. The guided wave radar send, sends the wave kind of out sideways in these circles, and it keeps sending them out until uh, something makes that, uh, that circular signal change. Uh, and again, not represented very well here, but these are bigger circles. Uh, these, are, uh, these are bigger circles. These are medium circles and these are smaller circles and they're reflective of the density of the material um, that that signal is being sent through and when the electronics uh, sense um, two consecutive measurements that are different from the previous measurements it then determines that this has been a, a change in the density or um, a difference in in the medium so that detects it as a level point Okay, radar is pulsed down on the surface, reflected back up to the sensor via this uh, rod or cable. <coughs> and you see here again the signal represented by, uh, by peaks. Okay, the detection method uh, for, radar, uh, for radar is called time domain reflectometry. I believe this has been removed from the ILM, but as the uh, as that pulse is guided down the rod, it reflects off the surface, back up the rod, and the time is used to calculate uh, that level. Um, because it uses the speed of light rather than the speed of sound, it's not affected by those conditions that affect ultrasonics. Uh, does anyone remember what those uh, effects are, those problems are? Pressure, vacuum, temperature, those things. Okay, applications. Uh, guided wave radar is used commonly for interface measurements. Um, real life, they can be problematic um, because they rely, uh, and this is very specific to uh, radar, but they rely on consistent dielectric constant. What a dielectric constant really is just a measure of the conductivity of a fluid. Um, and it's very, very critical um, for radar transmitters. Okay, the layers dies must be different enough for the detector to distinguish and at a minimum uh, a dielectric of 1.4. Um, and they really do have to be significantly uh, different. Okay, additional applications for radar, um, those applications where there's changing viscosity, density, or acidity, uh, agitated surfaces, uh, high temperatures and pressures, fine powders, uh, and sticky fluids, um, these are all uh, great applications for guided wave radar. Um, I've mentioned down here on the bottom, uh, emulsion layers can cause problems. Uh, and the re what an emulsion is, is a mixture uh, between two different layers. So a good example is uh, oil and water, which we know don't mix very well. Uh, water is very conductive, oil is not conductive at all, but when you mix them together, they adapt characteristics of both, and that becomes very problematic again uh, because then we don't have a distinct difference between our dielectric constant uh, and that causes that's probably the biggest issue uh, really with um, radar level transmitters is the process itself okay advantages of radar uh, 
at least when we start out here, uh, they're non-contact. We'll spend some time talking about a whole bunch of contacting ones, but some of them are non-contacting, just like uh, ultrasonic was. Uh, they are immune to most vapors and physical characteristics of the media, so that makes them a little bit better than ultrasonic. Uh, they're highly accurate. Uh, they're not too worried about vapor space changes, so again, uh, problematic for ultrasonic, but better uh, for radar. Disadvantages, uh, they're expensive. Uh, they're not great for fine solids. Uh, same kind of idea for ultrasonic as well. Uh, deposits on the antenna can cause multiple reflections, although modern technology can deal with this. Um, it is a possibility. Uh, and it says in the ILM that it cannot measure interface, uh, which is not true because I just told you a couple slides ago that it does measure interface. Um, but again, the major consideration here is is it a good interface? Uh, if it's a good interface, not a problem. If it's one where we get an emulsion, uh, that could be that could be rather problematic. Okay, uh, non-contact uh, radar installation. So this is essentially the exact same thing as it is for ultrasonic. So we deal with uh, obstructions. Again, we want our beam to be able to travel down to the surface and come back without having any uh, obstructions in the way, so you don't want it uh, over here, for example, compared to over here. Parabolic effect, again, just like uh, ultrasound, uh, same idea, half of your radius is the magic number, and again, uh, avoiding this parabola, uh, which could cause uh, some funky reflections. Angle, again, plus or minus five degrees. Uh, filling turbulence, uh, that type of thing here. So don't put it, don't put it right here in the where we're filling. Move it over to the side, or use a stilling well if you have to. Um, foam and turbulence. Uh, again, the, the magic uh, pill uh, for foam and turbulence is, is really the stilling well, uh, and there's a couple of different names that they they use for stilling wells, um, as well as bridles. Um, so again, bridles can be used. There's different issues uh, using bridles, usually associated with temperature differences, um, but again, um, just one of a few methods that we can uh, deal with foam uh, and turbulence and dust and things of that nature. Okay, uh, even more detail on these stilling wells. You'll see we, they mentioned stilling wells here quite a, quite a bit here, and this shows a better representation of what a stilling well is here. Uh, it's gotta have holes in here so that the process uh, can get in there, otherwise you end up with uh, a vapor lock type situation here. It's like uh, plugging the end of the straw and pushing the straw down into your uh, into your drink. It won't pick up any of this fluid, so there's got to be these holes to allow the level to go up and down uh, inside of it as well. So quite enough, I would say, on uh, stilling wells. Here's where the ILM took a pretty big twist in the latest revision, and that's on antenna styles. And there are absolutely many, many different antenna st styles here. Uh, and as we go through them, uh, just understand that they're generally uh, all created for some specific feature. Uh, and that is probably the testable material on these uh, is their applications and uniqueness in terms of what they are meant to do best. Okay, so cone antenna uh, works well for level uh, applications, um, has little effect from condensation and buildups. And I just hit on the major points for all of these things here. Uh, again, important here, cone protrudes into the vessel, not stuck up in the nozzle here because there's the potential of the uh, signal to kind of be impeded by uh, the vessel walls there. Rod antenna, uh, benefit here, smallest nozzle size. Um, least sensitive at the antennas, uh, good invented and low pressure vessel applications. And uh, excuse me for going really quickly through here, but these are uh, basically um, my notes, um, hopefully just to help you um, get through um, some of the details a little quicker. Process seal antenna, this is a unique one, uh, suited for corrosive uh, applications and applications where condensation uh, and dust buildup are possible. Um, 
Also with con uh, conductive fluids that have a dielectric of greater than 10. And we'll talk about dielectrics more in, in other subjects, but don't worry too much about them at this point in time. Uh, this is a good one here. We have a Teflon window. Um, the signal can pass through it. Uh, this prevents condensation, dust, and other things from building up on the, uh, the device itself. Lots of times there will be cleaning mechanisms built into these as well, whether it's a spray of water or a spray of air or something like that with a, a flange in here to help keep it clean. But we'll, uh, we'll address uh, those benefits in, uh, I believe, a different device um, with a similar mounting application. Parabolic antenna here, great big, huge uh, antenna here. So as a result, it's much more accurate and sensitive. Uh, good for solids uh, and liquids. So this is the first one that got mentioned uh, for solids. Narrow beam, uh, ideal for slim vessels with fixed roofs. Um, so again, I'm not really going to elaborate on it. Um, GBs are uh, specifically mentioned in the ILMs. So as such. Uh, good and well, uh, fully testable based on these application criteria. Stilling tube antenna here, great. Another, another stilling tube here. Uh, good for turbulent vessel applications with low dielectric media. The example given in the ILM specifically mentions uh, propane. Not sure exactly why, um, because the ILM is basically new. Um, but there you go. Calibration. Uh, is essentially matching the signal to the level. So basically you measure the level and you adjust the vessel uh, height so that the transmitter uh, matches that uh, vessel height. Uh, so just adjust the transmitter to match the physical height. So again, nothing too crazy there. Measuring tape and a button or two or a screwdriver maybe. Okay, false echoes we mentioned earlier with ultrasonic, same idea, uh, same technology exists in radar here. And again, it's a feature used to electronically modify the sensor to eliminate false echoes. And these false echoes, uh, you know, obstructions, uh, turbulence, foam, whatever they may be. So this is what a signal looks like. Uh, all of these bumpy things here could be considered to be false echoes. Uh, our surface measurement signal is usually much higher. So through this technology, we can go along and we can go click, 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 and basically make a threshold line. Uh, and this is also called uh, threshold tuning sometimes. Uh, and basically this red line says disregard anything underneath me and, and only uh, pay attention to this signal here. So pretty handy. Now we'll look at contacting styles uh, and mounting. And you'll see again, many different styles for these guided uh, or these radar transmitters. Uh, we now call them guided or contacting styles and they'll use some type of a, a rigid metal probe or a flexible cable of some kind. Um, we mentioned five different ones here, rigid single lead, flexible single lead, uh, coaxial, rigid twin lead and flexible twin leads, so a multitude of different uh, applications. Okay, guided wave radar, again, continuing here. These are generally used where internal obstructions would give false signals. Uh, the wave uh, is guided down the probe, and this is how we get around uh, it wanting to go and uh, bounce uh, all the way to the sides of the uh, vessel. This kind of guides it specifically to avoid any of those uh, obstructions. Some of the things that we have to uh, consider with the guided wave uh, installation here, uh, and I'll talk about uh, all of these ones individually, uh, but this one here I'll just address right now. Uh, vessel characteristics in particular, uh, avoiding metal contact. If the probe shorts out essentially on the metal tank anywhere, uh, that's what it's going to detect as its level. So you want to make sure that you avoid metal contact. Okay, position, again, uh, pretty logical and straightforward uh, in terms of things that we have to consider here. Uh, this diagram says don't mount it in the flow stream. Uh, and if you have to mount it in some type of a turbulent application, you're gonna wanna anchor it. And we spend a little bit of time talking about uh, anchoring here. So obviously 
Um, having this thing dingle dongling around in here and having this mixer spinning is going to be problematic for a number of different reasons, right? It's going to be wishing around and more than likely it's going to get tangled up in here. So anchor it in a situation like this. Uh, similarly in here, uh, you, don't, you don't want it to be in, in an area where it can get damaged or bounced around too much. Okay, probe coating, uh, non-metallic vessels and solids, no diagrams to uh, stimulate your brains with here. Um, but probe coating basically, um, when stuff gets built up on the on the on the probe, and again, some manufacturers will tell you this is not an issue. Uh, it may or may not be an issue. Uh, what usually determines that is the dielectric of that coating. Uh, low dielectrics will have less of an effect. Uh, higher dielectrics will have more of an effect uh, when it comes to coating. Um, Non-metallic vessels require some type of a metal uh, flange or, or mounting surface, and that has to do with the electronics and the grounding and shielding uh, in here. The vessel itself can be non-metallic, uh, but the mounting uh, point should be uh, metallic, I believe. Um, not the be-all, end-all, but something to consider. Solids, uh, probe strength considerations. Uh, you don't want to break it, right? If we looked at the example on the previous slide, if this was rocks or gravel or, I don't know, you pick, pick something, I guess, and they're falling in there and hammering on this all the time, you know, it's not going to be that durable. So you don't want to break it. Okay, chambers. Uh, again, we've talked about this many, many times, but one thing we haven't mentioned thus far is if we have uh, a bridle or a side-mounted chamber here, we got a couple of options. Uh, rigid probe in here, or a flexible cable type probe. Uh, we mentioned earlier, you don't want it touching uh, any metal along the way, so that's bad. How do we get around that? We either anchor it down or uh, they use this little centering disc uh, on the bottom here, and that helps keep this probe uh, in the center uh, of our bridle. Anchoring, again, we've touched on this many times, uh, whether it's bracketed, uh, unistrut, whatever it happens to be in u bolts, or whether it's an eye and it's tied off, or whether it's a sleeve, uh, it doesn't really matter as, as long as it's you know, fixed uh, to the vessel some way. Particular note here in diagram D, uh, dealing with solids, and again, this angle of repose, uh, you want to be perpendicular uh, to that surface if you can, plus or minus five degrees. Well, wow, that was the end. So no math or very little math, which is great. Again, um, most of the uh, devil in this ILM is in the details uh, related to applications uh, specific to uh, the way that the signal is, is sent down. So whether it's this type of cone or that type of cone or this type of cable or rod, um, but pay most attention to um, applications. Where are they best suited? What are their strengths? and what are their weaknesses. <laughs>